Thank you, James. Now on Radio 2, we continue the 50th birthday celebrations of the Light Programme, as Chris Stewart recalls some of the network's favourite programmes and personalities. Good morning. You know, it's quite appropriate that this programme should be starting just after the nine o'clock news, because 50 years ago, that's exactly the time of day when the light programme first went on the air. That start-up time did change quite quickly on Sundays, though, and for a most interesting and unexpected reason. Just one of the secrets I'll be revealing during the next hour and a half as we indulge in a little time travel and revisit the light years. There are some of you, I suppose, who may be wondering why this scrapbook of light program memories should begin with a nursery rhyme. It has nothing to do with Listen With Mother, but everything to do with the services which preceded the light program. So a little history lesson first, nothing too painful. During most of World War II, the BBC's domestic output consisted of the Home Service and the Forces program. Now, as peace in Europe approached, the BBC let it be known that it was going to introduce improved services for its listeners at home within 90 days, it said, of the end of hostilities. Well, in fact, this was accomplished with a week or so to spare. And at 9am on Sunday, July the 29th, 1945, Tom Chalmers came to the microphone to inaugurate the new service. Good morning, everyone. This is the BBC light programme on wavelengths of 1,500 and 261 metres. It's the first time we've said those words, BBC Light Programme, which we hope are going to mean for you now and in the days to come all that is best in radio entertainment from nine o'clock in the morning to midnight. Now I'm handing over the microphone to a colleague who will bring you the news. Japanese warships damaged in Tuesday's big carrier ball attacks on the Inland Sea we are hit again by British and American aircraft yesterday. An enemy battleship already damaged was sent to the bottom. The voice of Alva Lidal reminding listeners to the new network that the war wasn't quite over. So what was this new light program going to be like? Well, writing in the Radio Times, the Director General of the day, Sir William Haley, put it like this. Developing its own special character, it will, we hope, be one of the most successful ventures the BBC has undertaken. Well, that was the public face. Privately, things were put a little more bluntly. At the end of 1944, an internal and interminable memorandum had said that the new service, then called simply Programme B, would be a popular but not rubbishy programme for the masses, designed to be effective in competition with neighbouring sponsored stations. <laughs> It's that nursery rhyme again, and this time in the form of an interval signal, half inch by the light programme from its previous owner, the Allied Expeditionary Forces programme, which had recently ceased its operations. I suppose it's the 1940s equivalent of today's jingles, used to fill those embarrassing gaps when programmes grind to a halt or announcers run out of things to say. Anyway, enough lecturing. Let's resurrect some light programme shows. That's what we're about this morning. I should say that our selection isn't going to be chronological. It's not even in date order. It's, it's just a small sample of what the light programme did, plus a reminder of some of its most celebrated voices. Although it was conceived primarily as a music station, there were plays on the light programme and serials and quizzes on the light programme as well. An early success, which was a sort of quiz, was actually an American import. In the States, it was called It Pays to be Ignorant. Over here, it tickled listeners' fancies as ignorance is bliss. Thank you. Thank you. Now, here's the next question. So give me your undivided attention. This one comes from Veronica Story of 5 Broxash Road, West Side, London. And she asks this. A car is traveling at 50 miles per hour. 
How many miles per hour does another car go if it is traveling at the same speed? Here, is that all one question? Of course it is. What did you think it was? I thought you was reading the 10 o'clock news. Look, it's a perfectly simple question. I've just bought a beautiful new car. It cost me 2,000 pounds. I passed it outside as I came in. Now I've got to get another. Why, what's the matter with it? It's facing the wrong way. Mr. Muller, why don't you get yourself another idiot and settle down? Certainly, Mr. McPherson. Can you cook? My old man's very handy with cars. Do you know he made ours out of odd bits from other cars? Go on, did he really? Yes. He used the chassis, the engine, the wheels and the body of one car and the hooter from another car. Look, will, will you stop that and try to answer the question? A car is traveling at 50 miles per hour. Where's he going? He's not going anywhere in particular. Then what's all the blinking hurry for? <laughs> it's people like that what causes all these accidents. 50 miles an hour and he don't know where he's going. What a geezer. <laughs> Harold Behrens, who along with Gladys Hay and Michael Moore made life a misery for Chairman Stuart McPherson, a Canadian sports commentator, in point of fact, who was one of BBC Radio's most popular broadcasters in the 1940s. It was almost two years into the new service, March 1946, before one of its best-loved programmes was first broadcast, though it quickly became a light programme institution. Initially heard six days a week, its first compare was Robert McDermott. Still mystified? Well, let's drop in, shall we, on Tim Gudgeon sometime back in April 64. There we are. We've come round the pips for nine o'clock. Now let's go round the corner and meet Kenneth Horne for Housewives' Choice. Funny how reticent some people are to give names, whereas others literally fill their postcards with full details of two or three hundred people they'd like mentioned. At 37 Atherley Road, Shanklin, in the Isle of Wight, lives Mrs. D. Walker. She has a daughter whose home is The Nook, Avenue Road, Shanklin. Well, I'd like to be able to tell you the daughter's name. I'd like to blazon it to the skies. But alas, Mrs. Walker is not forthcoming. It's a pity because it's her daughter's silver wedding anniversary today. Kenneth Horne with Housewife's Choice. And I expect you heard Roy Hurd presenting a new edition of that programme yesterday. In fact, the extract we've just heard is pretty much all that survives from the original series, which ran for just over 21 years. And by the way, you can hear more of Kenneth Horne later in this programme and also again this afternoon at two o'clock in Round the Horn. But back to Housewives' Choice. What records did the hordes of listening housewives actually ask to hear? Well, just about anything and everything, it seems, and they certainly enjoyed a titter. Now, 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 whoa! Vindy, this is my record. Right, go. Now down in the meadow, in a little fishy pool, lives three little fishes and a mama fishy too. Now swim, said the mama fishy, swim if you can. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Are you taking the mickey? So they swam and they swam right over the dam. There was George. Woof, who didn't add what me? There was Perth. Woof, who didn't add what me? And there was Cecil. Wobble, I didn't have wobble. Oh. He was a snob. He was dying to get into an aquarium. So they swam and they swam right over the dam. All right, whoa. Don't start that again. Right. Now stop, said the mama fishy. You'll get lost. Oh, I'll pay you. Ooh. I hope you won't get the impression I'm mad, because I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but the three little fishers weren't going to be bossed. Come on, they said, let's go out on a spree. Oh, so they swam, they swam right down to the sea. George, who would it not want me? Who would it not want me? So they swam and they. Wait a minute, we've lost Cecil. Cecil, Cecil, come on, boy, get up there. Oh, I didn't add one. Oh. Well, there's no need to fly into a passion. 
so they swam and they swam right down to the sea. Gosh, it's the little fish, it's here's enough of fun. We'll play around here until they get done. This is ridiculous, isn't it? They swam and they swam and it was a lark. Till all of a sudden, they saw a shark. Mm -hmm. Shark. Wow, I did not want Oh, I'm choking myself. Never mind. Oh, said the little fishes, here's a lot of whales. So quick as they could, they turned on their tails. Their tails, their tails, their tails. Ah, that shook it, didn't it? You thought the needle had stuck. I'm a little tinker. And back to the pool in the meadow they swam. They swam and they swam back over the dam. George, who bought it? That one. Who bought it? That one. Cecil, Cecil. Oh, quick, quick. Oh, quickly. Oh. oh, no. Well, that was the end of the three little fishes who ended their lives as whale meat dishes. And here's the moral. Never disobey your ma'am and swim over the dam or you'll end up as ham, <laughs> lamb, or a jam. And now, scram. Wonderful Frankie Howard, of course, who made his name in another regular light programme show, Variety Bandbox. Now, there's no harm in a little fantasy, is there? A little mild deception, as long as it makes for effective broadcasting. And in May 1949, a program that wasn't all it seemed started out on a 20-year run. Good morning to you all. This is Sandy here to welcome you once again to our chapel in the valley. I hope you're all in the mood this morning to listen to some of these old hymns and one or two sacred songs that have been chosen for the services which are to be held here at the chapel later on today. Well, all our friends have been busy rehearsing the music for some time now. Mr. Edwards, Anne, and of course the chapel organist, Mr. Druitt. And I think we might go inside now and join them for the next half hour while they carry on with their rehearsal. Chapel in the valley. But which chapel? What valley? Did the pictures painted in the mind correspond to some kind of reality? Or was there an element of, how shall I put it, misrepresentation? Yes, there was, listener. Mr. Edwards, for instance, was actually called Harvey Allen. Mr. Druitt was Charles Smart, though it was Sandy McPherson introducing the programme. As for the venue, chapel, yes. Valley, no. Not, I have to tell you, some idyllic rural backwater, but a chapel in Hoxton, North London, where the BBC Theatre organ was kept. Sorry if you're shocked. Now, just before Chapel in the Valley, you heard another variation on Oranges and Lemons, played this time by the distinguished harpist Mari Goosens. Well, here she is again, but introducing what? Do you remember? <laughs> Dead right, those genteel glissandi served to herald the daily entries in Mrs. Dale's diary, launched in 1948 and quickly a national favourite. Yesterday, you may have heard an episode from 1958 here on Radio 2. This morning, let's go back a further ten years to episode 162 from 1948. Mrs. Dale, played by Ellis Powell, is preparing to move to the fictional London suburb of Parkwood Hill. Mrs. Morgan came for the day today. We decided to start turning out the ethics, and what a job that is. Now, Mr. Morgan, all these old medical papers, just look at them, bundles of them. We must send them to the salvage people. Hmm. Don't suppose they do for the white <coughs> elephant stall for the Guild Bazaar? I wonder now, would they? Oh, I don't think anybody would want to read these. They're all full of medical details. It's a magazine for doctors only. Well, all the same, make good reading, they do, I dare say. There's many likes to read about insides. Very interesting insides are. Well, I think we'd better throw them away. I'm sure Dr. Dale doesn't want them. We can catch the dustman with them today. 
Oh, and there's a mess of rubbish here. Just look at this, Mrs. Morgan. It's a case full of bird's eggs and nearly all broken. Bob used to collect them when he was at school. Oh, this must go to the dustbin as well. Well, I could put them on the white elephant stall, what's not broken. Somebody's going to be glad of these, some kid. Well, if you think they'll be any use. Now, what's this? Oh, <laughs> do look, Mrs. Morgan. It's an old gardening head of mine. Come think what he's doing up here. Now, hmm? that'll be ever so nice for the stall. Some lady will give us a couple of bob for it. Oh, no, Mrs. Morgan, you can't put this on the stall. Can't I and won't I? My friend Mrs. Bitmead and me is running it together. Mrs. Bitmead will be ever so pleased with this, ma'am. Can I come in? Mrs. Freeman told me you were upstairs here. Why, Kathy, how nice to see you. I didn't think you were back from your honeymoon. Good morning, Mrs. Morgan. Morning, Miss McIntosh. Mrs. Morgan. Oh, dear. <laughs> Mrs. Ferguson, I should say. Well, I'll be taking these rubbish papers down to the dustman now, because I can hear them coming along the road. Excuse me, please, Miss Mecca, the, the Ferguson. Oh, as he, Mrs. Morgan, hasn't changed. Oh, don't take any notice of her, Cathy. I should bring it back. Mrs. Dale's diary was actually the successor to an earlier saga called The Robinson Family. You can get a measure of the style from this plot summary, which was printed in the Radio Times 1952. It goes like this. Last week, Mrs. Owen called to see Mrs. Dale and said how pleased she was that Jenny and Bob were good friends. Mrs. Dale was annoyed and stressed Bob's friendship with Elaine. The family all made resolutions. Dr. Dale's was to give up smoking. This made him very irritable, both with his patients and the family, especially when his car broke down and he had to borrow a very old one from the garage. Mrs. Dale tried to make him smoke again. <laughs> Searing stuff, isn't it? Smoking doctors wouldn't do these days. A glass of water and some citrus fruit. Two years before Mrs. Dale's daily doings arrived on the airwaves, long and medium in those days, of course, another daily serial had been launched. For five nights a week, boys of all ages were enthralled, gripped even, by the dashing Dick Barton Special Agent. Now, as far as we're concerned these days, special agents are what they add to detergents to help them get the stains out. But in those early post-war days, they were heroic chaps who feared nothing. No VAT then, good heavens no. And if you want more, one o'clock today, there's half an hour of Dick Barton starring Noel Johnson in a remake of Barton's first adventure. At this stage, though, I thought you might like to hear the original recording of the whole Dick Barton signature tune played by the Queen's Hall Light Orchestra. Devil's Gallop from Dick Barton. In 1948, 12-year-old David Gamble, Darlington, wrote to the Radio Times, I should like to ask... He was a 12-year-old, you see. I should like to ask, where do all his enemies get their van loads of explosives? I couldn't even get two shillings worth of fireworks for the 5th of November. Indignation oozing from every pore. And he was probably even more indignant when Dick Barton vacated his evening slot in the schedules to accommodate shenanigans of a more earthy guy. The 
the archers, which neatly complemented the urban gentilities of Mrs. Dale's world. Just under four years after the archers began, a dramatic turn in the storyline deflected public and press attention away from a real-life event. Mysterious, all will be revealed. It's September 1955, and Phil Archer has rescued his wife, Grace, from a fire and accompanied her to hospital. His father and sister, Dan and Christine, await his return to Brookfield. Why did it have to be midnight that went back in? If Grace hadn't gone back after her... I uh, probably slipped a kid collar after he tied her up. You hadn't got it on when your Uncle Tom found her. Yes, perhaps. Yeah, I don't suppose they had much time to tie him properly. When they fetched him out, Chris, they, they had to work pretty fast, you know. Yes. Oh, I'll never play badminton again. What a fool I was to go out. Oh, don't be daft, love. Nobody knew the place was going to catch fire, now did they? No. I just don't understand how it happened. The loft went up first, you say? Ah, oh, so I believe. I heard one of the firemen saying something about a bonfire somewhere near. A near. bonfire? Ah, uh, Reggie's chaps were sweeping up the leaves yesterday. A bit of wind got up. But mind you, I'm not saying that's how it happened, but if the wind had taken the spark up into the hayloft... Yes, it could quite easily happen. Yes, it's easily done. Oh, had somebody just come in? Not Mum, surely. It's too early for her to be back. Yeah, my might be your Uncle Tom or Phil, perhaps. Oh, it's Phil. Uh, yeah, didn't expect you back quite so soon. Chris and I was it. Phil. Phil there. What's gone wrong? In my arms. On the way to hospital. She... She's, she's dead. the next morning all the papers were full of the death of Grace Archer totally eclipsing that real life event I told you about and what was it it was the opening night of independent television naturally the BBC strenuously denied a plot but it's a fact that that week's Archer's episodes were recorded not weeks in advance as usual but on each day of transmission and that final dramatic denouement was taped barely an hour before it was broadcast Many years later, those involved in the programme's production admitted that the timing had been deliberate. But that wasn't the only occasion on which the BBC was economical with the truth. As I said earlier, to begin with, the light programme opened up every morning at the gentlemanly hour of nine o'clock and ran through each day until midnight. But then in 1946, the BBC announced that Sunday's programmes would begin at 8 a.m. and end at 11 in the evening. The official reason given was that analysis has shown that the listening public is substantially greater between 8 and 9 than between 11 and midnight. But I'm able exclusively to reveal, he said, donning his tabloid hat, that the real reason for the change was that Radio Luxembourg was resuming full commercial broadcasting on July the 1st, and the earliest start for the light programme was to allow it precisely to compete with Luxembourg. <laughs> This one, don't you? Puffin' Billy, the signature tune to children's favourites. Originally called Children's Choice and initially presented on Saturday mornings by whoever that week's Housewives' Choice compare happened to be. I bet the little darlings were a bit flummoxed by the likes of Gilbert Harding and Godfrey Wynne, but common sense soon prevailed. And dear old Uncle Mac, doyen of children's hour, took over the reins. The programme quickly established its own list of favourite recordings and they weren't always musical recordings. Remember Reginald Gardner, the man with the one-track mind? I have a theory about railway engines being bad-tempered. Well, when I say bad-tempered, that's putting it mildly. 
They're actually livid, furious beasts, and they loathe humanity. So different from a ship, which is a sad, proud, graceful creature. You know, I can never understand why an engine driver isn't afraid of the monster he's in charge of. But he isn't. And when the train's about to leave, he pulls down a lever, and this livid beast is unleashed. Like this. so forth on its journey. Well, now we've unleashed this livid beast, we find it still equally furious, and it has a colossal argument with the rails it's running on, like this. And that goes on the entire journey. And not only does it have a colossal argument with the rails it's running on, but also all the other rails when they dare to cross its own. Like this. And so on. Well, then we get out into the country, and we come to a little rustic bridge spanning the railway. It's quite inoffensive, this dear little bridge, but the engine can't bear anything within its reach at all, so it shouts at the little bridge as it goes underneath. Like this. Proceeding on our journey, we find from time to time that we tear through certain wayside stations where no train has ever deigned to stop. People have been standing waiting on these stations for centuries, but the engine ignores them, shouting as it rushes past like this. Now, there's one thing I must know before I die, and that's something that takes place in a tunnel outside Snow Hill Station, Birmingham. You dash into the tunnel very fast and the brakes go on and you look out of the window and all down the tunnel at intervals are a lot of flare lights. And in between these flare lights are men, standing. They're leaning on shovels and pickaxes and golf clubs or anything they can get hold of. And these men, they live there, definitely. And as you go slowly through the tunnel, an extraordinary noise starts at the far end and slowly crashes past the window. I have no idea what it is, but it goes something like this. I think it's a piece of tin, which has been nailed to the side of the tunnel with some number on it or something which doesn't seem to mean anything to anybody, and it's too big and it strikes the side of the train as it goes through. And presumably the men are merely there to bend the tin back, ready for the next train to hit it when it goes through the tunnel. Now lastly, I'm going to tell you the one thing that an engine loathes more than anything else, and that is another engine coming in the opposite direction. That it cannot bear. And by this time you'll have settled down, having got quite used to this diddle dum diddle dum nonsense and all the other maddening noises, when suddenly, to your horror, this new thing bursts upon you and nearly knocks you on the carriage floor. It's the most frightening thing in the world, and it goes something like this. Well, folks, that's all. Back to the asylum. Goodbye. <laughs> Temple, I can hear the Cognoscenti saying, uh, because this tune, Coronation Scott, did indeed usher in the adventures of Francis Durbridge's super sleuth. It also gives me a chance this morning to talk about some of the network's other drama output. Now, much of the light program's drama was exactly that. It was light. It had an element of built-in comedy. And there's no better example of that than the adventures of PC-49, played by Brian Reese. 
Have a listen to a scene from The Case of the Black Diamonds, and as you listen, see if you can remember what PC-49's name was. Trust you to be on that train, 49. You draw crime like honey draws the flies. I can't say I'm flattered, sir. Quite sure you saw nothing unusual? Quite, Sarge. The man clipped our tickets just before we reached Stony Park, then passed on towards the mail van. It, have you recovered the diamonds, sir? Yes, black diamonds. Black, sir? The nearest we found to diamonds were two small pieces of coal in the mail van floor. Well, we've checked everybody on that train very carefully, and they all appear to be above suspicion. Of course, we can't tell how many passed through the barrier, but in response to our broadcast message, eight of them have come forward. All thoroughly respectable people. Did you find the young lady in the mink coat, sir? What young lady? There was no young lady among the eight who answered our broadcast. Nevertheless, Sarge, one did pass through the barrier just before it closed. She dropped her glove. I tried to catch her. Seemed in an awful hurry. What was she like? Oh, very elegant, sir. Mink coat, crocodile shoes, nylon stockings, trim ankles. You didn't notice her hat, I suppose? Uh, no, Sarge, I didn't get that far. What's that, Constable? Uh, uh, I, I was picking up her gloves, sir. My line of vision was somewhat <laughs> limited. <laughs> and his name? Well, OK, I'll tell you. His name was Archibald Barclay Willoughby. And he was created by an Australian journalist named Alan Stranks. PC-49 was without doubt the first uniformed policeman, as distinct from a plainclothes detective, to become a national hero. But if it's heroes you're after, they don't come more heroic than the central character in this innovative series. Journey into space. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in Operation Luna. Journey into Space was the brainchild of BBC producer Charles Chilton. And yes, that was David Jacobs. It was all revolutionary stuff. And there was no holding Jet Morgan, who boldly went where no one else had yet gone. And wherever Jet boldly went, Doc and Lemmy and Mitch boldly went too. All right, Doc. I'll get into the pilot seat. As soon as I'm settled, I'll go over to Intercom. Right. Well, that's peculiar. But uh, most fortunate. Well, what is, Mitch? Well, so far as I can calculate, we're about 17,000 miles above the surface of that planet. Uh-huh. And our speed is approaching 10,000 miles per hour. And that's exactly what our height and speed would have been now if we were approaching the Earth after taking off from the Moon. Except that it would have taken us more than four days to get this far instead of just an hour or so. Hello, Doc. Now settled in. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me, Mitch? Yes. Estimated distance of surface is 17,000 miles. Speed, 10,000 miles per hour. That's just what it would be if... If we were approaching Earth, I know. I just explained that to Doc. Yeah, I suppose this couldn't be the Earth, could it? How could it? Well, it seems to have land and water and clouds and ice caps. I wish we could think it was, Lemmy. But the ice caps on Earth are nothing like the size of that one. It isn't the Earth, that's certain. But from here, it looks as though our best bet for landing will be to treat it as though it were. Get to your posts and stand by for landing procedure. Yeah, okay, okay Jen. Right. I'll try to estimate our acceleration rate and... Hey, listen. Huh? Oh, it's here again. That music. Those ships must be around somewhere. Yeah, I can hear it too. Yes, so can I. Jet, do you hear it? Yes, Doc. Can you see them? Are they out there? No, I can't, but my view's limited. I can't see behind. Stern view. Switch on the stern view. Stern view? On? There they are. And still in that circular formation. Oh, now what are they up to? Are they going to try and turn us away from here too? Ruin our only chance? Can you see them? Yes, Jet. They're directly behind us. Why don't they leave us alone? Jet, you better come out of that cabin quick. If we're going to accelerate again, and, and you're sitting in there, the pressure could break your neck. No, don't worry, Mitch. I'm on my way out. Doc, let me get to your bunks. Lie down. Yeah, they ain't catching me this time. Are they still there, Mitch? Yeah, look. Get onto your bunk, Mitch. We'll leave the televiewer on, trained on those ships. Yep. If nothing has happened by the time we're close enough to that planet to go into orbit, we'll go. Ships uh or no ships. Journey into space. Jack Morgan played by Andrew Foles, who later graduated to that other great theatrical arena, the House of Commons. We present Peter Brock and Archie Andrews in Educating Archie. We'll be educating Archie, so we'll be busy for a while. With Alfred Marks, Harry James, Tony Hancock, Julie Andrews, Peter Madden, the Tanner Sisters and the Headley Ward Trio. We'll be educating 
not a chief, or want a job for anyone. He's no good at spelling, he hasn't a clue. He tells us three sevens to make twenty-two. It's a problem you can see. To be educated. Educating Archie, which began in 1950, and it starred Peter Bruff with his dummy Archie Andrews. Ventriloquism on radio was not a new idea. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy had done it in the States. But what was notable about Educating Archie was the number of rising stars it featured. Did you hear that cast list? Well, here are just two of those rising stars, Max Bygraves and first Tony Hancock. Hey, the next lady and gentlemen, if you please. Seats in all parts, absolutely no waiting. Cartoon, newsreel, trailers, food flash, and mammoth stage presentation. Oh, yes, and a film. <laughs> well, Archie, shall we go in? No, not yet, Brad. I'm enjoying the thing to this. <laughs> I said there are seats in all parts, two feature films, 12 rounds of boxing, ice show, amateur talent contest, suits cleaned and pressed. Uh, got... two, uh, two one and threes, please. Yes, sir, certainly, sir. Two one and threes, and you're just in touch. Oh, no. Oh, not again, no. <laughs> Chewing in all parts, standing at 12 and 9, <laughs> three pound chains. Queuing, queuing, but there aren't any queues. Well, don't just stand there, start one. Mm. I don't think you know anything about running a cinema at all. Oh, don't I? I'll have you know, young man, I was practically bored in the cinema. Oh? What was showing? Ben Hur. It was during... <laughs> yes. yes, it was during the chariot race, but... <laughs> Archie, yes. Archie, stop annoying the man when he's trying to do his job. Leave him alone. Oh, that's all right, sir. I know how excited these youngsters are when they come to my cinema. <laughs> They just love to see my double features. Uh, what have you got? Two heads? <laughs> yes, I use the other one for banging against the wall. <laughs> Flipping kid. <laughs> 30 days to September, April, June and November. All the rest of 31, excepting February alone, which is 28 days clear. And I've arrived and to prove it, I'm here. Mr. Bygraves, I'm ready for the end of term examination. Oh, you yeah, all right. Open your mouth and say ah. Oh. Huh? oh, not that sort. The examination at the end of the term. Oh, that end of term. Yes, I thought you meant the medical you got when you finished your sentence. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, exams. Right, have you got a pencil? No. Well, sharpen your finger. <laughs> oh. oh, I'm sorry, boy. No disrespect. Here. <laughs> Here, you can borrow my pencil. Oh, thank you. Right, eyes down. First question. Where is Hyde Park Corner? It's at the corner of Hyde Park. Yes. <laughs> yes, well, you're all right on geography. <laughs> oh, Mr. Bygraves, look, you have to ask me more than that for an exam. All right, then. Where is Africa? Oh, good, good. Now, Africa is situated... Next, the... we uh, have... Uh... Hey, wait a minute. I haven't finished yet. Oh, all right, go on. Mm -hmm. Right, now. Hey, half a jiffy, I won't be long. Here, you've filled half the page already. I will be a minute now. Come on, call my pencil's going down. <laughs> I've got to mark that lot. The question was simply, where is Africa? Well, it's a detailed answer. Look, the answer is, it's a broad. <laughs> Another huge comedy success for the light programme was a show that was originally part of a wartime series called Merry-Go-Round. In fact, Merry-Go-Round spawned three peacetime shows. Stand Easy with Charlie Chester, Waterlogged Spa, starring Eric Barker, as well as Much Binding in the Marsh, featuring Richard Murdoch and Kenneth Horne, with, in this extract, Sam Costa. You know, sir, I can't keep my eyes off your tie. <laughs> well, look, I bet there's no one else in this country with a tie as bright as mine. <laughs> of course not, sir. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Was there something? Costa, where did you get that tie? Well, Sir Emily made it for me out of a pair of her It's a very stuff. nice tie. <laughs> and that explains why it's got whalebone down the edge. <laughs> Tell me, Costa. <laughs> Costa, where did you spend your holidays? Well, sir, as I told Mr. Murdoch, I went to the lakes. Yes, of course, Costa. The Italian lakes. Well, sir, Mrs. Lake was Italian, but Mr. Lake keeps the paper <laughs> shop... Uh, Mr. Lake keeps the paper shop next to us at Croinge. But, Costa, I understood you'd been to see the beauties of Italy. Oh, no, sir, I missed that. That was at the Croyne Empire last week. <laughs> this week, they've got sporty girls of Vladivostok. <laughs> Costa, where were you last week? I've just told you, sir, I was at the lakes. You see, before she married, Mrs. Lake was a Miss Tutti Fruity. 
She was she was in the restaurant business, and once a week she used to make the sweet course. I know, Pancake Tuesday. No, Ice Cream Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth made you spend your holiday at the house next door to yours? Well, Emily and me thought the change of air would do us good. <laughs> and did it? Oh, yes, sir. We're two different people now. Oh, really? Who are you? That's right, sir. <laughs> and what's more, Emily's twinges have completely disappeared. Oh, it's a pity we still have nothing to talk about now. So I suppose you're going to the lakes again next year? Oh, no, sir. We've got quite different plans. Oh. Yes, the lakes are coming to stay with us. <laughs> and much finding in the marsh. Although we've had a rarely good vacation. Tiddly pop pop. And much finding in the marsh. We are happy to be back in circulation. It seems to us like ages since this little song we sang. And in the interim, I think the piano's had a prank. It's all right on the... Then suddenly goes... And much binding in the marsh. And much binding in the marsh. The story of my halls I'd like to retail. And much binding in the marsh. Good, Murdoch. Give me every single detail. Well, I started in off... In Bermuda, Murdoch, when you go to sup. And then I went they to... They give you lobster cocktail in a cup. And finally... Most interesting, but in New York... Shut up! And much finding in the marsh. Last verse and much finding in the marsh. Although his Paris trip was not so dusty. And much finding in the marsh. Poor Dudley's French had got a trifle rusty. He met a lovely mademoiselle and fell in love with her. But when the girl said promenade avec moi, monsieur, he couldn't quite recall the French first. <laughs> <laughs> and much finding in the marsh. Lovely audience. Much finding in the marsh. They're all my relations. And much <laughs> Now, another series that kicked off on the light but later found a home on the home was Eric Barker's whimsical show, Just Fancy. Fairly unusual because it was performed without a studio audience. Had to be, really. It would have been hard to believe in Eric Barker and Derek Geiler as two old friends resident at Cranbourne Towers Hotel if their exchanges had been regularly interrupted by audience laughter. It was gentle, subtle comedy. And in this scene, we find one of the old gentlemen laid up with a broken ankle. Well, how does it feel? Oh, 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 much better. Uh, thank you, yes. yes. Now, don't you feel, old friend, that you have to stay up here all the time uh, with me, you know? Oh, well, don't yeah. be silly. I mean, you'd stay with me, wouldn't you? Well, the same say, circumstances. You know, uh, well? Well, if I were confined to my bed. Yeah. Oh. Well, you did, man alive, when I fell down the stairs oh. and my, my, my knee gave oh. out you. Yes, yes. Don't you remember that? Oh, my word, yes. I shall never remember it. Uh, forget it. Oh, we played drafts, eh? Exactly. <laughs> oh, come in. What is that? It's the uh, door, oh. The door. Oh, most proud. <laughs> Two lots of flowers have just arrived for you, so. Yeah. Oh, look, all the... For me? Yes, sure. Here we are. Chrissy, I'm Chrissy? Oh, how oh. lovely they are. Oh, well, oh. Now let's just have a little look at the cards here. Uh, hurry day. up and get well. Ivy and Stanley Mossbrough. But that is... Uh, oh, you, you, you shouldn't have, you know. <laughs> well, thank you. With our sincere and heartfelt sympathy, sir. Oh, really? You are a good lad. I, I don't know what to say. You're so kind. <laughs> yes, I don't think uh, much of this bunch, do you? What the whole? Oh, they're lovely, too. But <laughs> well, uh, who sent them, then, then, Miss Pratt? Well, this card says, You old juggings from your old friend. Oh, you sent them, then. Oh, well, it is... <laughs> Just my walking stick that did the trick, you know. <laughs> oh, dear. You're, you're most kind. That's Eric Barker, Derek Geiler, and Kenneth Connor in Just Fancy. Naturally, variety also had its place in the light programme schedules. I've already mentioned Variety Bandbox. And there was another series which ran from 1948, summer months only, showcasing talent that was appearing beside the seaside.
stars are always bright. Be gone, dull care. It's Blackpool Night. Audience participation. These were the days when the billings in Radio Times read a bit like a music hall poster. Joseph Locke, romantic tenor. Wally Wood, guilty but insane. Mavis White, the tiddlywinky girl. Hesitate to think what that act was. Anyway, back to Jack Watson, Blackpool, 1963, for a rather convoluted introduction to an up-and-coming double act. Month after month, the premium bond winners are picked. But I never have any luck with Ernie. He has a namesake, and we can all be in luck with him. For this, Ernie's wise. His bond is with Morecambe, and we're all invited to be shareholders in their jolly company. Meet those energetic young partners, Morecambe and Wise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. That's it's like being in a front room, isn't it, with all these pianos? <laughs> Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen... That's clever. Yes. yes. It gives me great pleasure. Yes, yeah, I must say that. It gives me great pleasure as well. well what are you talking about? What are you, what are you talking about? I was saying it gives me great pleasure to be appearing on the show. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, I wouldn't. No. And it oh. isn't every day. No, 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 obviously not. That no. one gets the opportunity to see such a nice, happy, smiling audience. What do they do? <laughs> well, they don't do anything. They just sit there. What? They're only here because it's free, really, aren't they? <laughs> no, I mean, you are. You're right. You're only here because it's free, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got news for you. There's going to be a collection. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, alongside the variety in the comedy shows, there were also light programme quizzes. There was What Do You Know, which developed into Brain of Britain. There was Round Britain Quiz. And most popular of all, there was 20 Questions. In that programme's early days, Stuart McPherson was the chairman. And back in December 1949, we find Richard Dimbleby engrossed in a solo round in hot pursuit of... What, precisely? When you use these things out of doors, do you manipulate them in your hands or uh, are they there and do they stay where they are when you use them? Sometimes you manipulate, manipulate them with your hands and other times you just use them. Six. I should imagine if you're using one of these you do a little bit of manipulating. I don't know. <laughs> six. <laughs> you think I've got one of these? <laughs> I don't know whether you've got one but I happen to know there's one at your home. Seven. In, in the average home, would you find this upstairs or downstairs? Um, I should say, it's not in a lot of homes, but those homes in which it, it is in would be upstairs, eight. In the bedroom? I wouldn't think so, no, nine. Upstairs, not in the bedroom. In the bathroom? In the bathroom, ten. This is something that you find in the bathroom which is used indoors and outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> that might, uh, that might have been better expressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could have talked with your hands. <laughs> That's 11. Does this cost you anything to use outside? <laughs> Some, sometimes it costs you something and other times you can use it for nothing. <laughs> How much it costs. <laughs> generally, generally a penny. <laughs> I just go back a second, that, that uh, is used outdoors as well as indoors. It costs generally a penny. I've got one. You think I have? I, 
I know you have. I don't know whether it, it, it is regarded as your property or the household's property. Is it used by all of us? Uh, that I don't know either. Fourteen. I think it's a weighing machine. What a relief. Another popular series that contained a quiz element, though it quickly became incidental to the interviews, was Have a Go. Very simple format, couldn't be simpler in fact. Presenter travels to different location each week and talks to people. But it was a simplicity that had great appeal and Have a Go propelled an actor and one-time newsreader, Wilfred Pickles, to nationwide fame. In December 1961, Wilfred turned up in Colompton, Devon for another spot of homely fun, presenting the people to the people. David, let's have a bit of fun. You know, the last time I had an auction on this program, it was at Tavistock, uh, and it was young Ian Gillis, and he auctioned me. Now, uh, uh, what about you auctioning me? You know. <laughs> Just for fun, David, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll make her a horse. <laughs> right, well, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and privilege this evening to offer you this very first class thoroughbred filly. <laughs> Beautifully groomed, sound in wind and limb, <laughs> clean fetlocks, well shod, <laughs> and guaranteed to carry good weight, gentlemen. <laughs> She has been hunted. <laughs> now, what are you going to stop? 35. 30 shillings I'm bid. 35, 35, 40 I'm bid. 45, 45, 50 I'm bid. 55, 60 I'm bid. 65, 5 guineas I'm bid. If you all finish, I'm selling then at 5 guineas. Oh. <laughs> Very good, David. You'll be delighted to know, ladies and gentlemen, she's been sold to a farmer from Tiverton and he's 94. <laughs> Signature tunes have always been a potent force in broadcasting, and this one, Calling All Workers, heralded a wartime programme that went on to enjoy a long peacetime run. Music while you work. The ensembles that played the non-stop medleys didn't seem to have any existence at all outside the BBC studios. Ralph Ullman and his Bohemian players, Bernard Monshin and his Rio Tango band, Michaeloff and his Mazurka Orchestra, and Falkman and his Apache band. Well, later today, Victor Sylvester's orchestra, who were and are real, will recreate one of these programmes. Meantime, to carry us to the 10 o'clock news, here's another Music While You Work Immortal playing Whistling Rufus. It has to be Troy's and his Banjoliers. Eighty-eight to ninety-one FM. This is Radio Two from the BBC. The 
News at 10 o'clock. This is James Alexander Gordon. And in half an hour, Brian Hayes celebrates the 125th anniversary of the British Red Cross and seeks your views on 50 years of the welfare state. Until then, we return to Chris Stewart as he continues his ramble through the light programme's byways with a musical memory. Yes, why not sing it again with us as we present for the next 30 minutes a quick fire sequence of popular melodies, old and new. The words of music make you want to sing it and then just take that catchy tune and sing it again. First tune comes from a little lady of song, Mrs. Campbell's lovely daughter, Jean. Sing before breakfast, help the birdies along before you have that buttered toast. Rejoice before you use that coffee pot. Use your voice. The whole world may be funny, but it is good enough. If you are short of money, honey, put it on the cup and sing before breakfast. Never cry a thing before you eat that shredded wheat. Sing, sing, sing. Not the first little turning, but the second little turning is the place to find Frankie Boy. Gotta get my old tuxedo pressed Gotta sew a button on my vest Cause tonight I've gotta look my best Lulu's back in town Gotta get a half a buck somewhere Gotta sign my shoes to slick my hair Gonna get myself a boot in there Lulu's back in town You can tell all my pets All my blondes and brunettes Mr. Otis regrets That he won't be coming around you can tell the mailman not to call I ain't a coming home until the fall And I might not get back home at all Lulu's back in town Tim Gudgeon introducing Gene Campbell, Franklin Boyd and the Steve Race 4 Sing It Again And that sort of thing was typical of the light programme in the mid-50s Tuneful, jolly, totally innocuous But there was a musical sea change in the offing and the light programme was destined to be among its victims. At first, though, the change was gradual, and some traditions seemed entirely impervious to it. In most households, for example, Sunday lunchtimes were defined by roast beef, Yorkshire pudding, and a large helping of this. The time in Britain is 12 noon, in Germany it's 1pm, but at home and away, once again, it's time for two-way family favourites. came the dawn this morning and to borrow the title of one of the records to follow shortly down came the rain inches deep all over the roads gray and nasty and perfectly foul so we won't dwell on that two-way family favorites eventually dropped anchor at noon but it had drifted up and down the schedules a bit before finally docking in the middle of the day complete with its bumper bundles and is it possible to point to what might be described as a typical family favorites record it certainly is I'll be home, my darling, please wait for me. Breaking me up. Heartfelt or what? Pat Boone saying it with music on behalf of lonely servicemen and women. But the cosy sentiments of that song and the polite, light music which comprised much of the network's bread and butter programming were coming increasingly under threat in the mid-50s from the new teenage sensation. Rock and roll, mate! One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock! Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock! Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock! We're gonna rock around the clock tonight! 
Elvis Presley, the standard bearers of the American rock and roll invasion. And although the Beeb didn't succumb totally to the new music, it did recognize its appeal and launched a new program in October 1955. It was called Pick of the Pops. And the first DJ, somewhat incongruously, was Franklin Engelman, a former announcer. He was succeeded by Alan Dell, who in turn made way for... Well, let's tune in to the light program. May the 9th, 1959. Having closed the music album from this Saturday, it's time for us to open the record cabinets and take out the record albums, or at least the singles that have made the hit parade, because it's, what, but not quite. It's 11 o'clock and time for Pick of the Pops, presented by David Jacobs. Once again, it's welcome to music, the pick of the pups way. We welcome, in the first half of the programme, several new discs to the hit parade. Anthony Newley's EP, containing the four songs from Idol on Parade, has joined the bestsellers popper this week, so let's spin the title song. This is a camp that is mighty tough for where the marching see, in those days, the programme began with the top ten and then went on to play the new releases. So what was top of the charts in that 1959 programme? Stay tuned. Well, Miss Presley, currently number two on the hit parade. One wonders whether or not he'll be able to budge this disc off the top spot. There you go. Baby, here am I, oh, will you help me here so I could sit and cry? Well, golly gee, what have you done to me? Well, I guess it doesn't matter anymore. Do you remember, baby, last September how you held me tight each and every night? Well, whoops a daisy, how you drove me crazy, but I guess it doesn't matter anymore. There's no use in me a crying. I've done everything and now I'm sick of trying. I've thrown away my nights and wasted all my days over you. Well, you go your way and I'll go mine Now and forever till the end of time I'll find somebody new, baby We'll say we're through and you won't matter anymore There's no use in me a Sick of trying, I've thrown away my nights And wasted all my days over you Well, you go your way and I'll go mine Now and forever to the end of time I'll find somebody new, baby We'll say we're through and you won't matter anymore Buddy Holly's It Doesn't Matter Anymore, still top of the pops, and a really good one it is too. Certainly is. When David Jacobs stepped down from Pick of the Pops, he was replaced by an ebullient Australian called Alan Freeman. 
Here's the opening of his show from May 1964. Hi there, pop pickers. It's me again, and Sunday at four means pick of the pops. The lower top 20's top press reports, we've lost Richard Anthony and the Applejacks. Down comes Manfred Mann from 17 to 20, the Mojos from 15 to 19, the McGill Five from 14 to 16. Up goes Billy Fury from joint number 19 to 18, the Mersey Beats from 16 to 14, and Dion Warwick from 12 to 11. And the rest will meet in Unit 1, the chart newcomers, Unit 2, the new releases, Unit 3, the pick of the Pops LP spot, and Unit 4, this week's Top 10. Alan's presentation was altogether much brisker than David Jacobs' late night style and the tradition of playing the top 20 records on Sunday afternoons persists on Radio 1 and indeed on commercial radio as well to this day. And what was Alan Freeman's number one in May 1964? <laughs> And after only four weeks of chart fame, this week's number one pick of the pops, The Four Pennies and Juliet. It's four pennies worth at the moment. Millie still waits patiently. Roy Orbison and the foremost keep up the pressure. Scylla flashes in like a bomb. Cliff's there too. And it's the next pick of the pops. Next Sunday, all right? Right. Stay bright. Hello, my old mates. I'm very glad you could come along this morning. And we're kicking off straight away this week with a double event, a 21st birthday and a wedding. And uh, both of them happening to Christine. So I'm told by Chris Clark and Michael Bailey. Christine, they say, is 21 today. Congratulations, Christine. And getting spliced today, they say, at 12.15. So more congratulations. This is also for uh, four bridesmaids, Anne, Kay, Valerie and Jean. We're waiting with Chris at 8 Hawk Road in Stafford. Also for Michael and Paul, waiting in trepidation at 45 Lovett Street in Stafford. The record for all of you, the new hit by Laurie Johnson Orchestra, Suku Suku. Saturday Club, presented by your old mate Brian Matthew, which was an immensely influential programme in the early 1960s. An invitation to record a session for Saturday Club really was a sign that a group or a singer had truly arrived. Saturday Club became the nucleus of the light programme's pop music output, around which orbited Pick of the Pops, Easy Beat on Sunday mornings, and one or two lunchtime shows as well that were built round dance bands, Go Man Go, Parade of the Pops, and the Joe Loss Show. But it was Saturday Club that followed the trends, and any inkling of potential stardom meant that the perpetrators were wheeled into the studio for the obligatory Brian Matthew interview. The next few minutes are in the lap of the gods and the hands of the Beatles. In my young days, when I was a lad, they used to have actors in films, and that. Yes. now they... Hey, listen. It's all changed now, all changed. Well, this is what They're I wonder. doing that. No actors. In those oh, no. days, the actors used to say their best bits were left on the cutting room floor. Did you find that? No. No, <laughs> no, no. Those were the good bits in the film. You said that... You know I feel You know I feel all right. 
The Beatles and a Hard Day's Night. As the 60s wore on, the rise of pirate radio and its suppression by the government ultimately spelled the end for the light program. It was something of a dying fall because television had already eaten substantially into its audience, particularly during the evenings. The days when you could hear three top comedy shows in one listening evening had long gone. But in the middle 1950s, no show was more popular than the one starring the lad himself. <laughs> We present Tony Hancock, Sidney James, Bill Kerr, Hattie Jakes and Kenneth Williams in... Hancock's Half Hour. I'm fed up. <laughs> Oi. What? Why don't you shut up moaning and let me get on with the paper? Well, I'm fed up. So you just said. Well, so I am. Look, so am I fed up, and so is Bill fed up. We're all fed up, so shut up moaning and make the best of it. Ah, <sighs> oh, dear. There must be something we can do. Bill, haven't you got any bright ideas? No. That was a waste of time asking, really, wasn't it? <laughs> <sighs> you finished with that paper yet? No. I want to know what my stars say. What are you? June the 21st. What sign is that? The crab. <laughs> it says, today looks like being a very exciting day. Well, good luck to him. <laughs> I think I'll go to bed. You've only been up an hour. <laughs> that is, by the way, and nothing to do with it. I might just as well be in bed. There's nothing else to do. I wish I hadn't got up now. Your dinner wasn't worth getting up for, I'll tell you that for a start. Oh, well, I don't know. I ate all mine. That is neither here nor there. <laughs> you also ate Bill's and Sid's and mine. <laughs> I thought my mother was a bad cook, but at least her gravy used to move about. <laughs> Jaunty tune, sad moment. This is a piece called That's Where It Is, played by Woody Herman and his orchestra, and it was the final record ever played on the old light programme. In just a moment, we'll hear Roger Moffat performing the last rites, but first I must salute the indefatigable team who've helped assemble this programme. James White and J.P. Devlin in sound archives, Neil Somerville in written archives, Elaine Wigler, the production assistant, David Ryder, who compiled and wrote it, and Richard Edis, who produced it and paid for the coffee. I'm Chris Stewart. Up to here with nostalgia for those long-lost radio days between July the 29th, 1945 and September the 29th, 1967. The Light Years. Well, there we end broadcasting in the Light Programme, not just for today, but uh, as it seems forever. The Light Programme, that is, as it's known now, is closing down. But in only a few hours' time, the BBC with Paul Hollingdale will open up on 247 metres and 1,500 metres and VHF, that's at half past five. And then at seven o'clock on 247 metres, Tony Blackburn will open and swing into our new Radio 1 network. We hope you'll be with us not only at half past five, but if you like uh, pop music as it should be played and uh, should be introduced, in this case with Tony Blackburn, then uh, switch over or switch on to 247 at seven o'clock. Roger Moffat at this end, hoping that everything, your end, will be just as you would like it to be. With the time now at three and a half minutes past two, good night to you and good morning. Mm -hmm.